Okay, so hello everyone, welcome to today's CS lecture. So today we have RLE Busy giving a lecture today. So RLE, after completing two master degrees in neuroscience in biomedical imaging at Bordeaux University in France, she joined <laughs> McGill University in 2019. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Computational Brain Anatomy Laboratory under the supervision of Dr. Malar Chakravarty. Her research is investigating the brain with physiological and pathological aging using multi-contrast and multimodal imaging techniques. And she currently, right now, she is using morphometry, relaxometry, and cognition to better understand how the brain is changing in aging and in Alzheimer's disease progression. So without further ado, you can go ahead. Thank you for the info, Liz. Um, anyway, everybody. So today I'm going to present my work during my PhD, which is called the Investigation of the Hippocampus in Physiological and Pathological Aging Using Multi-Contrast and Multimodal Imaging Techniques. So if you have any questions, I can take them during the talk. Or if you want to wait, I have three main projects. So like maybe you can wait until the end of each if you have any questions. So as you probably all know, the population is getting older. Uh, sorry, the population that is getting older is increasing since the 70s. And it is expected to increase even more exponentially in the coming decades. And of course, that is a great thing because that means we are living longer. But it also comes with some drawbacks because we know that aging is a risk factor for a lot of neurodegenerative disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, brain cancer, stroke, or Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. And I want to highlight that the y-axis in these plots are not on the same scale. So you can really appreciate that Alzheimer's disease is one of the biggest risk factors that we have in. So in order to study the brain, we can use a technique called MRI, which is great to look at brain structure. So if we are looking at these two images of two individuals, which are both going to be normal, someone at 53 years old and someone at 78 years old, it is easy to see, to see that there is gross morphometric changes, such as the enlargement of the ventricles or the cortical thinning throughout the brain. And we could wonder, like, how does that compare to someone with Alzheimer's disease? So overall, we will see like similar but more intense effect of this ventricular enlargement and cortical thinning. But in order to recharacterize someone with Alzheimer's disease versus someone with, which is cognitively normal, we need some metrics. So we, there is different metrics that we can extract from this type of scans. For example, we can look at the cortical volume, which is known to, to decrease during the lifespan. And more specifically, if we look at the cortex, we, we know that the, the occipital lobe and the medial temporal lobe are the regions the most impacted in aging. And in the medial temporal lobe, there is this region of interest, which is the hippocampus, and which is known to decrease in the norm with this big decline after the age of 60. And the hippocampus is important because it is involved in a lot of cognitive processes, such as memory, but also because it is one of the first structures to be impacted in the Alzheimer's disease pathologic progression. So that leads me to my study, which was to investigate how the hippocampus changes in physiological and pathological aging. And the sub goals were to try to understand how the brain is changing in physiological aging in order to detect any deviation from this norm, to study how the brain properties are related to some cognitive domains which are altered in aging to understand the underlying causes of those alterations. And finally, to try to investigate what microstructure or morphometric changes would cause the variability that we can see in how people age. Because you probably encounter some individuals at 70 years old that are that have still perfect cognitive memory. However, some people at 50 years old will start to see some cognitive decline. So we will try in this last project to understand what risk factor could explain this variability. So in my first project, more specifically, I wanted to look at the hippocampal subfields. So it's different region in the in the hippocampus. And we wanted to mostly focus on the methodological aspect, which is to try to understand why we see a lot of variability in the findings in how the hippocampus change with age, because there is a lot of inconsistency in the literature regarding that. In the second project, we wanted to use some metrics which are a bit more specific, which are shape measurements. And we wanted to look at how the shape of the hippocampus relates to aging and also cognition. And finally, in my last project, we wanted to use another type of MRI, which, are, which is called quantitative MRI, that I will describe a bit later, in order to try to infer about the microstructure of the tissue and to see how this microstructure changes in aging, but also in Alzheimer's disease progression. So starting with the first project. So as I just mentioned, there is a lot of inconsistency regarding if the hippocampus is changing or not in healthy aging. So there is, for example, this study, which is cross-sectional, which didn't find any relationship with age. 
However, some longitudinal study after five years follow-up, they will find that there is a decline of volumes with aging. And in order to describe the hippocampus a little bit more specifically, because it is a very complex structure with different layers of cells, people have tried to define different subregions. And in this example, you can see how people like neuroanatomists, experts of the hippocampus, have been defining these subfields. And you can appreciate that it is very inconsistent because each of these images have been done, have been segmented by a different neuroanatomist. So you can see that there is a lot of variability. So of course, if we don't define the subfields in the same way, as that might expect why we see this inconsistency in the literature findings. And another layer of complication is also the type of segmentation method that we can use because there is the manual segmentation that is still the gold standard. However, with the increased open access data sets and very large study, we try to use more and more automatic segmentation because manual segmentation is very time consuming. And as you know, maybe there's a lot of different segmentation protocols that you can use. And depending on which one you use, of course, that can also explain why, why there is so much variability in the findings. Something else that to, to keep in mind is also the age range of your population that you study and also the way you model age, because we know that the hippocampus is changing in a nonlinear relationship in the lifespan. So depending on which age range you use, if you use only people older than 60 years old, you might find a significant decline over time. While if you try to include the entire age range, but still try to fit a linear model, you might completely lose this information. And finally, but not the least, the type of resolution and contrast of your scans that you are using can also impact your findings. So the T1-weighted scans, one millimeter isotropic resolution is a very standard type of images that we find in all types of data sets. But as you can see in this image, it is very hard to distinguish the subfields with this resolution and contrast. So in order to overcome that, people, especially like the specialists of the hippocampus, who wanted to study the subfields, have tried to develop a new sequence, which will allow us to see more clearly the subfields. And so this is what I will call throughout my talk the slab images. And so the, the specialty of this, the specificity of this type of images is that there is very high resolution in the corner plane, as you can see here, so allowing us to nicely see the curve of the hippocampus. However, it comes with the drawback of having very low resolution in the anterior to posterior axis, as you can see in this image. And finally, in this project, we wanted to also introduce our last type of images, which is a T2-weighted scan of 0.6 isotropic resolution. And we can see that we can still clearly see the subfields in this image, but we also keep very nice resolution and contrast in the anterior to posterior axis in this one. So in the context of this project, we wanted to try to really look at these three main category of funds to understand how we could characterize hippocampus better in the aging. So in order to do that, we used five data sets. Three of them are from our own laboratory, and two of them are open access with ADNI and CAMCAN data sets. So overall, we had 930 scans with an age range between 18 and 93, about 58% of females. And we had T1-weighted scans for all types of data sets. We had T2-weighted scans for the one acquired in my lab. And we had slab images for ADNI and the test retest. So I just want to highlight that for the test retest, we had all the modalities for the same participants. So T1, T2, and slab. So for the processing, we started with some quality control to remove scans with motion artifacts, such as in this image. Then we use the Mingdi Pipe Library pipeline to pre-process our scans, so to remove the bias field in homogeneities and also to extract the brain. Then we use Maggot Brain algorithm to extract the gray matter and white matter subfields of the hippocampus. And finally, for the statistics, we use linear mixed effects model. We use sex and ICV as fixed effects and data set, MRI sequence, and subject idea as random effects. We corrected everything for both multiple comparison using von Fern correction. So for the results, here I'm showing you one example of a subfield, so the CA1. So we can see the volume in the y-axis, and we can see the estimation for T1, T2, and slab. And I should also like mention that this specific figure is using the test retest data set. So that means we are, acquire, we are estimating the volumes in the same participants. So in theory, we should have the same volumes, no matter which type of scan we use, we are, we are using. 
However, we can see that with the slab images, we have a lower volume estimation compared to the one with T1 and T2. And if we look at all the subfields, we have nine in total, and we can see that we see the same pattern everywhere except in these two subfields, but we have similar pattern with slab having lower volumes compared to T1 and T2 everywhere else. So in, in overall, we found that the MRI sequence statistically impact the volume estimates, but now we wanted to know, does it impact the age relationship? Yes. Is it the one-to-one -one relationship when you have, do you have a slab and normal one in the same subjects to compare? Yes. And is it one-to-one? -one? Yes. yes. Okay. So like it's like for this, sorry. But I mean, if the rank, if you rank the subjects based on the volume, based on the slab, and based on the other one, do you get like the same ranking or is it highly um, correlated? So I didn't test it like, in, you mean like within participants? Yeah. I didn't test it that specifically. I'm, I assume that would be the case, but I didn't, I didn't test it that. So the next thing was to try to see how using different types of images would impact the age trajectory that we have. So here we are looking at the CA1 again, just for as an example, and we can see the relative proportion of each subfield when we normalize by the intracranial, intracranial volume and the total hippocampal volume. So basically, during the, the entire lifespan, do we see a relative impairment or relative preservation in aging? And so we fitted our model either using only the T1, only using the T2, or only using the slab images. So we did that for all the subfields again. And I just want to highlight some subfields. So for example, in the CA1, CA2, CA3, and the Fimbria, no matter which type of images we used, we obtained similar age trajectories. However, if we are looking at the CA4 on the gyrus and the phonix, we can see that while T1 and T2 are showing similar age relationship, we have a very drastic decrease of volumes with the slab images. And in the contrary, in the alveus and the mammillary body, we see the inverse relationship where we see an increase of relative proportion on the slab images, but not with T1 and T2. So overall, we demonstrated that the MRI sequence statistically impacts the age, age relationships. So the next thing we wanted to test was to double check if that could be due to our segmentation method. So in order to do that, we compared our maggot brain outputs with HIPS, which is another technique to segment the hippocampus. And the characteristic of HIPS is that it is using the same definition as we do. So the only thing that differs was really the segmentation protocol per se. And so we tested if we had different age trajectory, and that was not the case, which was a good indicator that maggot was performing consistently to other techniques, at least for the T1 with its scans. And we also wanted to compare maggot brain versus ashes, which is another segmentation protocol, which is specific to the slab images, because maggot brain was originally not designed to be performing on slab images. So we wanted to just make sure that maggot was not biased against it. So here, as you can see in these two images, we don't have, we, we are not using the same subfield definition. So we expect to see baseline volume differences, but we wanted to still look at how that if the age structure we were different or not. So we tested that and that was not the case. So overall that demonstrated that the sequence effect that we see on the age relationship were not due to our segmentation method. And so finally, accounting for all this variability, which subfields were the most preserved or impaired in aging? So overall, the CA1 showed a relative preservation no matter which type of images we used. And the CA2, CA3 showed the most relative impairments in aging. And that is interesting because if you're looking at the schematic of the, the hippocampus, we know that the layer three of the entorhinal cortex is projecting to the CA1, while the layer two is projecting to the CA3. And it is known from previous study that the layer two is specifically impaired in aging, while the layer three is relatively preserved. So that we go at least in the same direction that our finding, which was interesting. So I just basically said that. So overall, the contribution of this first study was to to be the first to look at the hippocampal trajectory in aging using multiple data sets and sequences. We demonstrated that the MRI sequence choice does impact the age trajectory. And that was in, important because most experts of the hippocampus in the field are using slab images, but we are showing here that 
these type of images might not be ideal to investigate aging. And so the hypothesis that I had about why we see this bias with slab images in aging was that these type of images were originally done in order to have high resolution in the coronal plane, but low resolution in the anterior to posterior axis, because we knew that the subfields were pretty consistent across this anterior to posterior axis. However, there is some evidence showing that in aging, the shape of the hippocampus might change and might become more curved in aging. And therefore, the anterior to posterior axis could not be aligned with this low resolution axis that we have in SAM. So that led me to my second project, which was to try to see if we, if we had an aging. Is this a good place to ask sure. questions about the first project? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. How do you resample? Do you know if the differences in the slab segmentations versus the T2 segmentations, for example, are in the boundaries or actually the fact that the resolution is super different and you're resampling um, to estimate the volume based on the um, order dollar resolution the slab images for, um, for the slide segment? So I'm not sure if I exactly got your question, but what I can say that all the scans and segmentation that I included in this project were quality controlled visually by two person. So like we, at least visually, that was following the, the hippocampus surface properly, especially because the slab images are so high res in the mm -hmm. corner plane, you can actually see that like they are nicely like fitting the subfields. But my guess in why, we see these big differences in slab is that there is some structures which are thinner than one millimeter resolution. So if you have a voxel size that is two millimeters thick, of course that can increase the estimation. Like mm -hmm. there is partial volume effect and there is like a lot of different reasons why that could be impacting the finding, especially for example, if you are thinking about the mam mammillary body, which are like a tiny dot basically with slab images, we, you cannot even fit this structure in a box cell, like. Do you resample then calculate the volumes so or mm. just calculate the volumes and multiply by the thickness? We used the resolution of the scans, like we didn't do any resampling. Um, yes, new space segmentations, labeling. So, but if yeah, you then you're calculating the voxels within that. Mm -hmm. And then your voxel size is 0.4.4 by 2. So yeah. you're multiplying with that. We, we count, we count yes. the volume. Yes. yes. I think. If you resample it with an order of four, for example, and then calculate the volumes, that that will probably like change and probably improve. I will I will assume that it will improve. Okay. But my goal was to really try to understand what people use yeah. in the field. Yeah. That was not to try to like improve. Like so that was to to say I like people are using that. If the differences can be because of this. Yeah, probably. How it can yeah. yeah. Like, for example, in Adney, they're using this as like a, people are using this as like a biomarker mm -hmm. for yeah. all sorts of things without considering this. So I think it's important to know what you gain and what you lose. Yeah, our goal was to really try to understand what like if there is a bias, not really to solve the bias, but like that could be a good thing to do for sure. Okay. So in this second project, we wanted to investigate the hippocampal shape and to also relate the shape measurements to cognition. So for that, we used a data set from our lab. So overall, after quality control and everything, we had 85 participants with an age range between 18 and 81, 60% of females. We had APOE4 status, so 32% of them were APOE4 carriers. And we also had some information about education and cognitive scores. So for the measurements, we used Maggot Morph, which provided us two vertex-wise information. The first one is called surface area. So it is defined at each vertex around the hippocampus. And basically, we can calculate if there is a surface area enlargement or reduction at each vertex. And the second metric is called displacement. And this one is more about like deformation. So we can calculate if there is outward displacement or inward displacement. So because we know from the volumes that the age relationship is non-linear, I wanted to investigate also non-linear relationship for the shape. 
So what I did is that I ran three different models at each vertex around, like for all the vertices of the hippocampus. And then I selected the best fit using AIC, which is a criteria to select the best model, but also privilege simplicity. And so I selected the best model throughout the hippocampus, and you can see the map of the best model displayed here, where everything in purple show a linear relationship, everything in blue show second order relationship, and everything in yellow show a third order relationship. And using these best models, I was, in, I was then looking at which one were actually significant in aging. So I found a significant linear decrease in mostly in the body and tail of the hippocampus. And I found second order and third order age relationship, mostly in the head of the hippocampus. So then I took these best models and I wanted to see at which age do we see the maximum surface area in the hippocampus and at which age do we see the minimum surface area in the hippocampus. And what you can see, especially if you focus on the maximum maps here, is that the maximum surface area was rich. So like the color is very dark blue in the body and tail, showing that the surface area was maximum very early in life, so around 18 years old. However, in the head of the hippocampus, you can see that it's more green, showing that there is this peak around maybe 60 years old. So in order to see that more clearly, we took some peak voxels. Oh, sorry. Um, and you can see exactly what I just described before. So in the body and tail of the hippocampus, we see this decline, linear decline over time. And in the head of the hippocampus, we see this more preservation of the surface area up to 60, and then this rapid decline. So overall, we found that there is a preferential surface area reduction in the body and tail. And importantly, we also replicated these results in an independent data set. So we use CAMCAN. So after quality control, we had 350 participants, and we use the same data-driven approach to select the best models. We then used partial least square analysis, which is a way to relate two matrices together. So for, for that, we had our first matrix, which is the behavior matrix, which is participants-wise. So each row is a participants. And each colon is a behavior or demographic scores. So we have age, sex, APOE4, education, and air bands. And we had another matrix, which was our shape measurement. So we had, again, participants for each row. And this time, the colons were each vertices, each vertex. Sorry. So PLS, the way it works is that the first thing is that we do a correlation between these two matrices, and then we perform singular value decomposition in order to, to obtain these latent variables that will describe a, a spatial pattern in the hippocampus, and we will relate that to a demographic pattern. And the singular value will tell us how much does that explain about the covariance between these two input matrices. So we did that for both surface area and displacement. I'm just going to show displacement for a matter of time. So for the behavior findings, we found that sex was not significant. We found lower air bands, lower education, APOE4 was not significant. And increased age was related to inward displacement in this most medial region of the hippocampus and outward displacement in the most lateral part of the hippocampus, as well as in the uncus. So if you put these two patterns together, you can see that there is this increased C-shape with aging and with lower cognition. And again, we did the same approach with CAMCAN dataset, and we replicated the same findings. So overall, we found this anterior to posterior axis when we use surface area, which showing with the decreased surface area mostly in the body and tail of the hippocampus. And that was interesting to see this axis because people have tried to characterize the hippocampus along this anterior to posterior axis, either by defining body, tail, body, uh, sorry, head, body, and tail using some kind of linear geometry, geometric rules, or either by defining anterior versus posterior, these different approaches. But here we use the data-driven approach to find this pattern. And we also obtain this medial to lateral axis regarding the displacement with mostly the inward displacement in this region of the hippocampus, which if we look at superior-wise corresponds to the subiculum region. And the subiculum is known to be the most myelinated region of the hippocampus in, in LC controls. 
So the next question was to, 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 to wonder, do we see an hippocampal microstructure change in aging? And also the same question, do we see a microstructure change in Alzheimer's disease progression that could explain these shape changes? So that's, if there is any questions about this project, or, yeah. Have you looked at the curvature itself? No, it's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> so, sorry? We don't have anything to extract yet. Yeah, yeah. like I, at that time, honestly, like I didn't have this option. That would be definitely something of interest to really like be sure about this curvature. Like there is different index indices that you can extract from other techniques, but that was not the goal, at least at, the, at, that, at that time, that was not available. And you have a vector field at each vertex or? Okay. okay. So moving on to the third project, looking at the hippocampus and the cortex, I will explain why later, using morphometry and microstructure in aging and also in Alzheimer's disease progression. So the myelin in the brain is very important for different reasons because it is helping the the axon and the propagation of the information to go fast in the brain, but also provides support to the neurons. And the myelination process is very dynamic throughout the lifespan with this big increase of myelin during childhood and adolescence. Then there is a plateau during adulthood followed by a fast decline in aging. The other molecule of interest in the brain that we can extract from MRI is the amount of iron. So iron is necessary for a lot of cellular processes, However, an excess of iron can cause neuroinflammation and therefore is not good for the brain. And it is known that in aging, there is an increase of iron in regions of the brain. So I mentioned in the introduction that I was going to use another type of MRI called quantitative MRI or QMRI. And in order to understand what is quantitative MRI, I'm just going to highlight what is weighted scans. So T1 weighted scan is really what is the most common in neuroimaging studies. And it is great for many things, such as extracting volumes or extracting shape information, because we have very good contrast between gray and white matter. However, the intensity of each voxel is not really meaningful of anything because it is impacted by a lot of different things, such as the property of the tissue, so like the T1 proton density, T2 contrast, but also it is impacted by the scanner inhomogeneities and also the scanning protocols. So depending on your echo time and repetition time, that will impact the intensity of the value. So it's not really meaningful to use the T1 weighted value. However, quantitative MRI is another approach that will allow you to have this, what we call T1 map. So it's in the same participants, you can see the comparison. And in theory, T1 maps should be only dependent on the T1 relaxation. So I'm not going to explain in detail what is T1 relaxation. It's a physical property of the tissue, but just you need to know that the T1 values, so like the, the T1 maps, have been related to myelin quantity in the brain. So you can see here a T1 map versus a myelin staining postmortem. And you can see that where there is low T1 value here in dark, in black, you can see that there is high myelin. And there is another matrix that we can extract, which is called T2 star. And T2 star has been related to iron. So you can see as well that where there is high, oh sorry, where, where there is low T2 star values, there is high iron in the brain. So we can use T1 and T2 star to try to extract some information about the amount of myelin and iron, but it's not as simple because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Even, even if the myelin has been related mostly to T1, there is also some contribution of iron on the signal and vice versa. So we can say that it's mostly reflecting on myelin or iron, but it's not purely iron or myelin. So it's important to, to know that. And also any kind of molecule in the brain that has some magnetic property will impact the T1 and T2 star value. So when we started to look at the literature about quantitative MRI in aging and in Alzheimer's disease, we first realized that there is very few studies using QMRI to investigate AD progression. So in order to overcome that, we are going to use a data set which has LC controls, people with familiar risk for Alzheimer's disease, people with mild cognitive impairment, and some individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And all of them had both weighted scans, but also quantitative MRI scans. 
The second challenge that we wanted to address that, that was that most studies are using region of interest-based segmentation, using a priori definition with some atlases or parcellation that might or might not be super relevant to your specific question of interest. So in order to overcome that, we wanted to use a data-driven parcellation of the hippocampus and the cortex. So here, I'm just stopping quickly to say that here we wanted to also investigate the cortex for two main reasons. The first one is that, as I mentioned, there is really not a lot which has been done using quantitative MRI in the Alzheimer's disease progression. So there is more that is known about the cortex compared to the hippocampus. That we, so we wanted to have some kind of baseline understanding of what to expect of these metrics in aging and in Alzheimer's disease. And also we wanted to see if the hippocampus will add more information compared to the cortex or vice versa. And finally, there is also most studies which have used quantitative MRI have used univariate analysis to relate, for example, T1 to cognitive scores or T1 to aging. But here we wanted to try to use a multivariate analysis to, to link a lot of different things together. So for that, we used, after quality control, 158 participants. So I mentioned that we had different groups. So we had quality control, people with family at risk of Alzheimer's disease, people with mild cognitive impairment, and some with Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the split by group for the number of participants and also by sex. Here you can see the density plot for the age range and also for the median age. So something that I want to highlight is that the median age for LC control, MCI, and AD were similar. However, the median age for the familial group was about 10 years younger. So of course, that is something to keep in mind for the interpretation of the results. For the MRI protocol, we used the MP2 rate sequence in order to have a T1-weighted scan and also a T1 map. And we use a multi-echo gradient echo sequence with 12 echoes to have the T2 star magnitude. So from the T1-weighted scan, we did the classic processing to obtain the pre-processed T1-weighted scan and also have this brain mask. We use CIVET to extract cortical surface and cortical metrics, such as cortical thickness and surface area. We use deformation-based morphometry to create an average T1-weighted scan and also to calculate Jacobians which are a measurement at the voxel level of volume change. And we also created an hippocampal mask in order to restrict our volume, sorry, our voxel-wise in the hippocampus. So using that, we were able to extract the T1 map and also by fitting an exponential decay to the T2 star magnitude, we were able to extract the T2 star map. And so for the cortex, we had four metrics. The first one was T1. So we had T1 vertex-wise and subject-wise. We had T2 star, again, vertex-wise, subject-wise. We had cortical thickness and surface area. And for the hippocampus, we had T1 voxel-wise and subject-wise, T2 star, and the relative Jacobians. So that was all the input that we used for the downstream analysis. So I mentioned that we wanted to use a data-driven approach to parcelate the cortex and the hippocampus. So we used a technique called non-negative matrix factorization or NMF. So this technique has been introduced in my lab by Dr. Patel in 2020. And so the way it works is that first we need to create our input matrix using all the different information we had. So cortical thickness, surface area, T1 and T2 star were concatenated in to form a large input matrix. And importantly, we z-scored each metric across vertices and across participants. So for CT, SA, et cetera, for T1 and T2 star as well. So that was our input matrix. And then we NMF is providing a decomposition. So it's going to give us a spatial matrix that will describe vertex-wise components. And the other outputs will be a subject matrix, which will be subject-wise components. So to make it a bit more concrete, so the spatial matrix will give us some components vertex-wise. It's important to know that the number of components is user defined. So in order to select the best number of components, we can perform stability analysis. And so in the context of the cortex, we obtain 10 components that you can see here. And you can see that all of them were pretty bilateral. And also they were like showing us region of interest that we, we expected. So for example, the frontal region in component two, occipital region in component three, medial temporal lobe for the component five, et cetera. 
And in order to interpret these maps, we also need to look at the other outputs of NMF, which is this subject-wise, metric-wise outputs. And so the way we often display it is like this. So with this large matrix where we have each row, we have one row per component. So the first row will be for component one, component two, component three, et cetera. And each line will be a participant. So we will have a weight for participant one CT, a weight for participant two CT, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can describe it such as, for example, the component one will have high CT weights, low SA weights, and medium T1 and T2 weights, T2 star weights. However, talking about weights can be confusing sometimes, at least for me. So I always like to go back to row values to make sure I interpret the weights properly. So it is what I did. So basically, I used the parcellation of NMF to create this atlas, basically. And I calculated the average row value per component per subject. And so if I display that in similar way with a matrix, you can see this first output, which look a bit weird because there is different range of values. For example, T1 values are much higher than CT. So in order to have something more comparable, we need to normalize this score per metric. And if I do that, we obtain this matrix, which look really similar to the one we obtained with NMF. And that allowed me to actually test how, how similar they were. And if I do the correlation between the NMF weights and the row value, I can see that the correlation is almost perfect. And even if I go to the lowest correlation, it's still very highly correlated. So all that to say that in the rest of my analysis, every time I have NMA, like high CT weights, I can actually say it's high CT. Like, weights and, and row values will be similar in the interpretation that I give. So now that we know how to interpret this matrix, we can look at an example. So for example, if I focus on component two, which is in the frontal region, we, we will say, okay, there is low CT, low SA in this region and high T1 and T2 star values. But then we can also look at a zoom picture of this T1 value, for example, and we can see that even though it's high on average, at the population level, there is still a lot of variation of intensity for each participant. And this inter-individual variation is what I will examine later on. So we did a similar approach for the hippocampus, voxel-wise this time, and we obtained four components that you can see here. So component one was mostly in the body and tail, component two was mostly in the head of the hippocampus, component three was mostly in the lateral region, and component four was mostly in the medial region of the hippocampus. So overall, we use the data-driven approach to parcelate the cortex and the hippocampus, and we obtained uh, some parcellation that was consistent with previous findings. But now we wanted to know how do those components relate to individuals' health. So for that, I had I wanted to include a lot of different risk factors for aging or Alzheimer's disease. And so, for example, I had some genetic information with the APOE4 status. I had lifestyle information with, for example, the blood pressure. So do you have high blood pressure, yes or no? We also had some cognitive scores with, for example, MOCA. We had some psychiatric information with, for example, do you have anxiety, yes or no? And also about different health-related information, such as cancer. But in reality, I had a bit more information than what I just described. So for example, for lifestyle, I also had alcohol consumption, smoking, drugs, blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. For cognition, I had MOCA, but also ARBANS and different subscore of ARBANS. I had depression and anxiety for the psychiatric information and a lot of different health-related information, such as brain injury or so on. And so in order to relate our brain pattern that we obtained using NMF to all this different medical information, I used partially square analysis again, and we found one latent variable that explains 75% of the covariance between the two. And the pattern was being APOE4 carriers, having high blood pressure and high cholesterol, having lower cognitive scores and higher anxiety and lower liver disease was related to a brain pattern that I'm going to describe. So overall, lower cortical thickness everywhere in the components, 
So if I show you a map just to summarize the effects, you can see it here. So overall lower CT everywhere, lower surface area everywhere in the brain. T1 at the cortex level was not related at all to this pattern. However, T2 star was related, but interestingly in opposite patterns. So we have lower T2 star in the frontal region and in the medial temporal lobe and higher T2 star in the occipital region. Moving on to the hippocampus information, we had lower volume in the body and, body and tail of the hippocampus here and higher volume in the most lateral region of the hippocampus. We had higher T1 everywhere in the hippocampus and higher T2 star everywhere in the hippocampus. So that's a big pattern to have in mind, but overall having like more Alzheimer's disease related risk, so like being APE4, et cetera, was related to this overall brain pattern. But now we wanted to know if this brain behavior pattern that we found was specific to age or, or, or groups, because you need to realize that this brain behavior pattern that we found, we found that without giving any information about the status of our participants or the age of our participants or the sex, like no information about the demographics were given, just the medical information. So, yes. So by the T1 not having, we're not getting signal from the T1, that's the Mia line, right? So can we can we say that usually Alzheimer patients will have you know, trouble walking, you will walk more? Is it to the is it is it due to the lack of Mia line that they have in the brain that they'll start walking differently or even holding things differently? Like their 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 their, their whole coordination is going to be altered. Is it due to the, that lack of Mia line in the brain? So it's not really that it's a lack, lack I'm not showing a lack of myelin in this okay. specific context. I'm just showing that the brain behavior pattern that we found was not related to the cortical myelin. I mean, if you assume that T1 is myelin. Okay. But I cannot really answer more than that at this stage, at least, I think. So then using PLS outputs, we have this brain and behavior score per participants. And the first thing I wanted to check is, okay, if I look at this brain behavior and I color code by group, what do I see? And if I do that, it's pretty interesting because I can actually like almost draw a line to separate the, the MCI and Alzheimer's disease versus the normal individuals. So like LC controls and people with high risk, but still like good cognitive score. And we wanted to test how significant that was. So I looked at the difference between behavior between each different groups. And for that, I used annuals. And basically all pairwise comparison was highly significant for the behavior, but also for the brain, showing that really the MCI and AD were loaded much more in this pattern than the controls. And just as a side note, I was really interested by this group of individuals in the MCI group because they were like very highly loaded compared to the rest of the participants in the same group. And interestingly, on all these participants, 80% of them were APOE4 carriers, which I found pretty interesting. So making them at higher risk, maybe, to get Alzheimer's. Is that differentially true compared to the bottom half of that? Class? So yeah, so like overall, the MCIs had 40% of APOE4 carriers. But this, if I only look at these participants, it's like 80% of them. So like much higher risk adding APOE4 carriers. So I wanted to also look at how this brain and behavior was related to age. So that's what I did. And basically both behavior and brain scores were highly related to age. We also wanted to look at sex differences. We didn't find any significant differences for the behavior. However, for the brain scores, we found that females were loaded higher than males. And finally, we wanted to check if education could be something that will explain some variation, but that was not the case in this study. So overall, we found that this brain behavior pattern that we found was significantly related to age, sex, and group. And those results are 
pretty in line with previous findings because it has been shown previously that cortical thickness throughout the brain is lower in APOE4 carriers than non carriers. There's also evidence showing that the memory scores is related to surface area at the cortex level. And also that, for example, anxiety increased the probability of converting to MCI or to Alzheimer's disease. And if we talk about the morphometric findings for the hippocampus, we found that the hippocampal component one, so like this body and tail component, was decreasing in with this pattern. And that is interesting because we found from the previous study that the body and tail seems to be the most impaired in aging. So that goes in the same direction. And we found that the volume of the component three, which is the most lateral region, was increasing with this pattern, which is somewhat surprising. I was not expecting to see any volume increase. My guess is that maybe we are actually capturing the outward displacement in this lateral region that I found when we looked at the shape. So that is maybe what is happening, but I'm not sure yet. And so like overall, the morphometric findings are really in line with previous studies showing that they are sensitive to aging and Alzheimer's disease. But now like looking at the cortical pattern, I was really interested by this T2 star pattern because it was a bit confusing at because we see this T2 star increase in the occipital lobe and T2 star decrease in the frontal and medial lobes. So I was a bit curious to understand like how could we interpret these opposite effects and if I want to relate that to previous papers in the field of QMRI I'm just going to do a, a small change here it's a bit confusing but basically T2 star can also be characterized as one of our one of our R2 star and most literature papers are using R2 star to describe their patterns so I'm just going to change my interpretation here briefly by saying that basically T2 star increase is similar to R2 star decrease. It's exactly the same. It's just nomenclature at this point. So just to keep that with R2 star to make it comparable, a previous study I found that R2 star increased when the myelin is increasing. So if I use that to interpret my results, that makes sense for the occipital to have a lower R2 star values because that would mean, okay, there is a decreased myelin in the occipital lobe with this aging and Alzheimer's disease progression pattern, which is to be expected. However, that will mean that my pattern is related to an increased myelin in the frontal region and the medial temporal region, which is really not what we would expect. So I, I, I tried, it's still a product in progress, but I tried to interpret that and find some reasons why we would see this opposite effect. And one thing that I have is that maybe we are capturing something else in the brain, because as I mentioned at the beginning, quantitative metrics can also be impacted by any kind of molecules that have some magnetic property. And for example, amyloid could potentially impact the metrics. And we know from previous literature that amyloid increase mostly where there is low myelin. So if I show you an average amyloid map with PET scan versus average myelin map using T1 over T2, for example, we can see that where there is high myelin, they, oh, sorry, where there is high amyloid, there is low myelin, for example, here in the preclinus, but also true in the frontal regions or even in the medial temporal lobe. And there is uh, studies which have, there is not a lot of studies who try to relate QMRI metrics to uh, disease markers, but there is one at least that shows that R2 star increase when there is more amyloid in the brain. And that was mostly true in the preclinus and the medial temporal lobe. So my guess, and again, there's no way I can really check that for this study, but I'm guessing that what we found here, which is this R2 star increase in the frontal region and in the medial temporal lobe, might be just capturing this increased amyloid load in my participants. But yes? I think I read somewhere that amyloid pumps like to hold on to some kinds of metals as well, like aluminum. Is that maybe a thing? Mm -hmm. I'm, okay, I don't know. I forget what sure. I read. I think I read that somewhere because a few years ago there was kind of a scare that aluminum was causing Alzheimer's mm -hmm. because they found aluminum in the amyloid plaques. Okay. And they were wondering, is this a is this a cause? Is this an effect? So I think there might be some evidence that they preferentially hold on to some sort of some sorts of metal ions. But what? 
what I, I know at least is that where there is amyloid accumulation, it has been shown with like mouse studies that there is also iron accumulation most of the time because it's like the tissue is like there is neural inflammation and like it goes with iron accumulation most of the time. So it's very hard to say like, oh, am I capturing amyloid or iron or like even like a loss of neurons, which will also impact the tissue property, which is, will be like increased proton density, for example. So like, it's very complex to say like what is causing what at this stage, or at least for this project, I don't think I would be able to like have more clues. But I have an additional project coming up <laughs> where I'm actually having I have PET scans and quantitative MRI, so I have amyloid information and tau information in addition to QMRI. So hopefully, I will be able to have a bit of more information about like what is causing what. But yeah. What about microbes? Could be, I don't know. You mean like visually? Yeah. Because you can actually assess them. And also like you can try to see from the literature the pattern of microbrids prevalence in different cortical areas and mm -hmm. if it matches your... Yeah, it's something I can definitely do. What would the audio be used for? Okay, it's something that's still in progress. So like. I have like additional time to like investigate that further. That would be a good idea. Yeah. So that basically concludes my presentation. So overall, these T2 star values seem sensitive to myelin and potentially to the Alzheimer's disease pathology progression. And so just to sum up, summarize my projects. So in the first one, I demonstrated that the sequence impacts the volume estimates and the age relationship. So we need to be careful about that when you study aging or Alzheimer's disease. In the project two, I related the shape to age and cognition and demonstrated that we might have this increased curvature of the hippocampus in aging. And finally, project three demonstrated this brain behavior pattern of at-risk individuals, which seems to be pretty sensitive to the progression of our participants. And the brain microstructure, micro specifically T2 star, seems to be sensitive of aging and Alzheimer's disease progression. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and thank my lab and collaborators and funding. Thank you. Do we have any questions or in the chat? In the last study, when you were looking at the brain morphometric measure, you just modified the TLS brain rating to the NMF? Um, so I used the NMF weights as input to PS. No, I'm saying when you were showing lower CT, lower, lower SA, no change in mailing, you just multiplied the two together at the subject level to get those values. Because what you get is the loading of the NMR in your PS. Wait, so do you talk about this? No, we can't see. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> right. uh, I will remind you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we need to move the share the just to oh, 20% remote. Uh, 20% remote. This? Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, can you so repeat your question? Basically, when you run the PLS, you don't get CTSA T1. You get NMF1 to NMF10. Yes. So, you then multiply these. No. Uh, these are really, so, yeah. so, not not really. So, like, what we what I'm putting okay, here is really sorry. the weight. Yeah. So, like, it's really about the weights. But, like, as I try to explain during the method, I checked before, before doing an interpretation, I, I really wanted to check that. NMF weights could be interpreted as raw values. And so I didn't use raw values here, okay. but I think I can still, I'm pretty safe interpreting it, like high city weights as high city. Is that, does it answer your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I can so, try. So for the TLS, what I'm saying is like, you have 10 by subjects. NMFs on one side, behavior by subjects on the other side, let's say 40. Mm -hmm. So what you are getting is a 10 by 40 covariance matrix on the PLS side. You project it back and you get 10. 
and now you are showing us the expanded head. The PLS doesn't. So you, that that was my question. So when you do the NMF, it gives you. Are you putting ten each NMF one score in the PLS, or are you putting extended? You have a weight per metric. Per participant. Per participant. So that's what goes in the PLS. So basically, maybe each component has four four variables associated. With. If I go back to sorry, I have a lot of silence. But like if I you switch your. Oh, so when people are saying, do I do that? It's not even I would sing all your secrets. Oh, please, not me. Okay, so so I know it's it's very small. I'm sorry for that, but like basically, every time we're looking at this type of output or input, it's like oh, nice. so like. I will have component, let's say component 10, participant one for city, component two, participant, sorry, component 10, participant two for city, et cetera. And then I will have component one, participant 10 for SA. So, like, what I mean is that for each component, okay, I, I will yes. have one weight per one matrix. Per component per model. Yeah. yeah. And then you put that as the input. Exactly. So NMF is still giving you separate weights per modality per subject. So like yeah, but those are weights. Yes, yeah. and as I, I I was trying to explain is that using weights as input to PLS was for me a bit intense to try to interpret them. So I wanted to just check that like weights could be interpreted as. City or yeah. say no, I, I get that you have like limited number of subjects. I'm curious if you put without the NML, just the brain. Oh, I I'm pretty and do sure the PLS, you will get the same way. That's a good question. Yeah. Like you mean yeah. vertex wise? Yeah, because PLS kind of because it's SVD, it takes the autocorrelations in to account. So how do you visualize that? But that's always like the people same way you bring it back to a parcelation. Basically, you get, you get one map. Yeah. So you get the loading, you put it yeah. each loading per modality in one map. Yeah, I could do that. I will have like vertex wise latent variable that would be related to that's one way. You can even go region wise just to test if it gives you yeah. like any parcelation. Yeah, I could definitely like test it. Or use an a priori parcelation. So it'd be going a different way, right? Exactly yeah. like NMF, but whether if you don't use NMF because the base now the weighting is per subject, but it's not a combination of the weighting coming from the components. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could use this. So like this, like it looks similar, but like basically I just use NMF as an atlas, I mean, extracted the average. So like it will, I'm pretty sure if I use these right inside like matrix. I was actually saying, you're saying impose a parcellation to begin with and take the yeah. mean value across each of the four metrics as your input to your. Like you can put vertex wise. The, the, the only issue with the vertex wise is it might tell you you don't have enough subjects to put this much to mm -hmm. done, just it's not as stable. You can run it definitely. It might even. Be very similar, so it's definitely worth trying with vertex wise. But if that doesn't work and it's very unstable, you can use another parcellation to see how much the NMF decomposition is contributing to the results. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm curious about. Like, is NMF helping per se, or not? I think it's it's helping in the way that like it's simplify. Like instead of talking about like thousands of vertices. I have like 10 components and it's also like easy to interpret because they are like very well like situated in the way that like frontal, medial, temporal, lobe, occipital. So like it, it helps me to like have this pattern that is more interpretable to my understanding. But I think that would go to the same. We would go like we'll say the same things no matter which approach we take. But that's something I can definitely test as I think, well. I mean, no matter what you do, I think your design choice ends up imposing another challenge, right? Because then it's like, is it resolution by parcelation? How many parcels is good? No, yeah. Do I use anatomy versus data-driven? You know, like, yeah. uh, uh, kind of. 
Well, you, you have those things to grapple with yeah, no matter what. But, but the base of the different parcels are the same per subject. Whereas here, when we say one component, it the, the loadings in different subjects is different. Yeah. And the loading on different measures are different. So when we say component five is our hippocampal gyrus, it is, but only in the sense of T1 and thickness, not in the sense of surface area. So it's not capturing everything in that area, in a sense. It's like talking about certain aspects of our hippocampal gyrus. Yeah, I guess for me that was like, that was, that was a feature, not a bug. <laughs> no, no, it's a bug. The question, what I'm asking is like how much is that contributing to the results mm -hmm. versus if you have it the other way? Yeah, like, it's disentangle like that. Yeah, I think that would be something that I could like easily it's, test. It's just, um, it's just a test. It's no, yeah, this is still there, and this is what you're finding. One more thing that mm -hmm. is, is interesting for me is there was this paper that came out last year. And they were looking at predictions, a lot of prediction papers go for surface area, thickness, and then they look at sex. But then if you put the brain size, most of it is gone. Like the prediction becomes, basically they are predicting brain size. Mm -hmm. SA is like, most of the findings I have had that comes from SA when you put brain size in, a lot of things change. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how can you, because when you put everything together, here it's very difficult to see how much of it's coming from the brain size. And as Alzheimer progresses, I assume that SA is changing partially because of that. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be very difficult to disentangle. Yeah. But that's something like that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I would. Answer that, but yeah. something something, something that to keep in mind. Uh, yeah. The previous studies we've visualized for UTT and, and total SA for each of the measures that we input, and that's been helpful. I think in the thesis that we reviewed that we did that because we did that. Yeah, and Justine's as well. Different end of the spectrum in terms of age, but that's it. It, it did in those in those contexts. It did. Take out some of those issues because that's what we we're seeing initially. Yeah, but again, those are neurodevelopmental studies. And no, those are that is a lot more there. But yeah. here is also just I haven't seen any report on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean we do relate after the fact to like sex and see that there is this like male female difference. So that's and interesting. Yes. So there is something here, but I don't know how to like account for that so one thing is to remove SA because that's the main size relevant mm -hmm. and see if the sex difference remains yeah I could, I could test that for sure I also like before like lumping all my PLS like all my components into PLS I also try to like run PLS only on the cortical metrics and only on the hippocampal metric like separately and exactly the same pattern was there so like I decided to just Put everything together, but like so, it was like one. That's it's one thing I could that's do. That's what you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's nice. Um, <laughs> but I could try to like remove one and see if that change or alter the results or not. That's something I can do easily as well. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we should probably end in the interest of time, but if everyone wants to stay and ask for any questions from online or local, please do. Michelle, sure. well done. Thank you.